invested a lot in your education and people have invested in you. And let me tell you, the world needs your talents. Man, does it ever. The world needs a lot and we need it from you. I mean, I'm not speaking for the rest of us up here, but I know I'm getting a little grayer. We need it from you, the young people, because remember this. So you got to get out there. You got to give it everything you got, whether it's your time, your, your, your talent, your prayers, or your treasures. Because remember this, you will never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. I'll say it again. You will never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. You can't take it with you. The Egyptians tried it. And all they got was robbed. So the question is, what are you going to do with what you have? I'm not talking about how much you have. Some of you are business majors, some of you are theologians, nurses, sociologists. Some of you have money, some of you have patience, some of you have kindness, some of you have love. Some of you have the gift of long suffering, whatever it is, whatever your gift is. What are you going to do with what you have? Fail big. That's right. Fail big. Today's the beginning of the rest of your life, and it can be, it can be very frightening. It, it's a new world out there. It's a mean world out there, and you only live once. So do what you feel passionate about. Passionate about. Take chances professionally. Don't be afraid to fail. There's an old IQ test was nine dots, and you had to draw five lines with a pencil within these nine dots without lifting the pencil. The only way to do it was to go outside the box. So don't be afraid to go outside the box. Don't be afraid to think outside the box. Don't be afraid to fail big, to dream big. But remember, dreams without goals are just dreams. And they ultimately fuel disappointment so have dreams but have goals life goals yearly goals monthly goals daily goals I try to give myself a goal every day sometimes it's just to not curse somebody out <laughs> simple goals but have goals and understand that to achieve these goals you must apply discipline and consistency. In order to achieve your goals, you must apply discipline, which you have already done, and consistency every day, not just on Tuesday and miss a few days. You have to work at it every day. You have to plan every day. You've heard the saying, we don't plan to fail. We fail to plan. Hard work works working really hard is what successful people do and in this text tweet twerk world that you've grown up in <laughs> remember just because you're doing a lot more doesn't mean you're getting a lot more done remember that just because you're doing a lot more doesn't mean you're getting a lot more done. Don't confuse movement with progress. My mother told me, she said, yeah, because you can run in place all the time and never get anywhere. So continue to strive, continue to have goals, continue to progress. I found that nothing in life is worthwhile unless you take risks nothing Nelson Mandela said there is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that's less than the one you're capable of living now I'm sure in your experiences in school and applying to college and picking your major and deciding what you want to do with life I'm sure people have told you to make sure you have something to fall back on make sure you got something to fall back on honey but I never understood that concept having something to fall back on. 
If I'm going to fall, I don't want to fall back on anything except my faith. I want to fall forward. I figure at least this way I'll see what I'm going to hit. Fall forward. This is what I mean. Reggie Jackson struck out 2,600 times in his career, the most in the history of baseball. But you don't hear about the strikeouts. People remember the home runs. Fall forward. Thomas Edison conducted 1,000 failed experiments. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Because the 1,001st was the light bulb. Fall forward. Every failed experiment is one step closer to success. You've got to take risks, and I'm sure you've probably heard that before, but I want to talk to you about why that's so important. I got three reasons, and then you can pick up your iPhones. First, you will fail at some point in your life. Accept it. You will lose. You will embarrass yourself. You will suck at something. There's no doubt about it. And I know that's probably not a traditional message for a graduation ceremony, but hey, I'm telling you, embrace it, because it's inevitable. And I should know. In the acting business, you fail all the time. Early on in my career, I auditioned for a part in a Broadway musical. Perfect role for me, I thought, except for the fact that I can't sing. I didn't get the job. But here's the thing, I didn't quit. I didn't fall back. I walked out of there to prepare for the next audition and the next audition and the next audition. I prayed, I prayed and I prayed. But I continued to fail and fail and fail. But it didn't matter because you know what? There's an old saying, you hang around the barbershop long enough, sooner or later you're going to get a haircut. So you will catch a break, and I did catch a break. Last year, I did a play called Fences on Broadway. I saw someone talked about it. Won the Tony Award. I, and I didn't have to sing, by the way. <laughs> but here's the kicker. It was at the court theater. It was at the same theater that I failed that first audition 30 years prior. The, the point is, and I'll pick up the pace, the point is every graduate here today has the training and the talent to succeed. But do you have the guts to fail? Here's my second point about failure. If you don't fail, you're not even trying. I'll say it again. If you don't fail, you're not even trying. My wife told me this great expression. To get something you never had, you have to do something you never did. Les Brown's a motivational speaker. He made an analogy about this. He says, imagine you're on your deathbed and standing around your deathbed are the ghosts representing your unfulfilled potential. The ghost of the ideas you never acted on. The ghost of the talents you didn't use. And they're standing around your bed angry, disappointed, and upset. They say, we, we came to you because you could have brought us to life, they say. And now we have to go to the grave together. So I ask you today, how many ghosts are gonna be around your bed when your time comes? Because the chances you take, the people you meet, the people you love, the faith that you have, that's what's going to define you. Never be discouraged, never hold back, give everything you got. And when you fall throughout life, and remember this, fall forward. Say thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for parents. Thank you for love. Thank you for kindness. Thank you for humility. Thank you for peace. Thank you for prosperity. Say thank you in advance for what's already yours.
It's how I live my life. That's why I, why I am, one of the reasons why I am today. Say thank you in advance for what is already yours. True desire in the heart for anything good is God's proof to you sent beforehand to indicate that it's yours already. I'll say it again. True desire in the heart, that itch that you have, whatever it is you want to do, that thing that you want to do to help others and to, to grow and to make money, that desire, that itch, that's God's proof to you, sent beforehand already to indicate that it's yours. And anything you want good, you can have. So claim it. Work hard to get it. When you get it, reach back. Pull someone else up. Each one, teach one. Don't just aspire to make a living. Aspire to make a difference. I'm here to talk about success, right? The first rule of success is to have a vision. You see, if you don't have a vision of where you go, and if you don't have a goal where you go, you drift around and you never end up anywhere. It's like you can have the best ship in the world, you can have the best airplane in the world. If the pilot or the captain doesn't know where to go, it will just drift around. It will not end up anywhere or most likely in the wrong place. So I was very fortunate that I stumbled onto my vision. I mean, as you know, I was born in 1947 in Austria after the Second World War. And I didn't really like Austria when I grew up. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I couldn't see myself becoming a farmer or a worker in a factory or anything like that. Even though my parents wanted me to stay there and have a normal life. My father wanted me to become a police officer like he was. My mother wanted me just to stay there and marry a girl with the name of Heidi, hopefully and have a bunch of kids and run around like the Van Trapp family in the sound of music. But that was their vision, not mine. My vision was totally different. I felt that I was born for something special, for something unique, for something big. Do you know how great it felt that I knew where I was going? Imagine the majority of people don't know where they're going. It's when you have a goal, when you have a vision, everything becomes easy. Because remember that in America, for instance, when you study, you will see the percentage of people that like their jobs. 74% hate their job in America. Now, there's not much different when you come to Europe. The majority of people don't like what they're doing because they're really not doing it because they didn't have a goal and they followed this goal. They just aimlessly drift around and then all of a sudden if there's a job opening so they get that job because you have to work. But then when you work, it's a chore. It's work. It's not fun. So if you think about only a quarter of the people really enjoy what they're doing in life. That is unbelievable if you think about it. So I felt so blessed that I knew what I was doing. It's like a medical student that studies and knows he wants to become a doctor. You know where to go. So I knew where to go. So people always ask me, when they saw me in the gym in the pumping iron days, they said, why is it that you're working out so hard? Five hours a day, six hours a day, and you have always a smile on your face. The others are working out just as hard as you do, and they look sour in the face. Why is that? And I told people all the time, I said, because to me, I am shooting for a goal. In front of me is the Mr. Universe title. So every rep that I do gets me closer to accomplishing that goal, to make this goal, this vision turn into reality. Every single set that I do, every repetition, every weight that I lift will get me a step closer to turn this goal into reality. So I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound squat. 
I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound bench press. I couldn't wait to do another 2,000 reps of sit-ups. I couldn't wait for the next exercise, for the next half hour of posing and all the kind of things that you have to do to be a champion. And with the age of 20, with the age of 20, I went to London and I won the Mr. Universe contest as the youngest Mr. Universe ever. And it was because I had a goal. So let me tell you something, visualizing your goal and going after it makes it fun. You got to have a purpose no matter what you do in life. You got to have a purpose. So that's rule number one, have a vision. Rule number two is don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to the naysayers. Everything I ever did, the thing that I heard out of people's mouth was, that's impossible. That can't be done. Or no. So whenever someone said to me, it can't be done, I heard it can be done. When they said no, I heard yes. And when they said it's impossible, I heard it is possible. I'm a strong believer of what Nelson Mandela said that everything is always impossible until someone does it. Well, I'm going to be the one I said to myself, I'm going to do it and I'm going to show it to them. Maybe it has never been done before. That's perfectly fine with me. But I'm going to do it. And I did not listen to the naysayers. The next thing, the third point that I'm going to make to you is, before we sit down with Jürgen and talk about the rest of the three is, work your ass off. There is no magic bill. There is no magic out there. You cannot get around. You have to work and work and work. And it drives me crazy when people say that they don't have enough time to go to the gym for 45 minutes a day and work out. Or to do something for 45 minutes to an hour a day to improve. If it is physically improve or if it is mentally to improve. Imagine you read one hour a day about history, how much you will learn after 365 hours in one year. Think about if you study about the history of musicians, of composers, how much you would know. Imagine if you would work on the business, on some business that you want to develop every day for an hour. Imagine how further along you will go and get. So it drives me nuts because we have, when people say we don't have the time, we have 24 hours a day. We sleep six hours a day. So it gives you still 18 hours. But there's someone shaking their head out here in front to say probably, I don't sleep six hours, I sleep eight hours, right? Or just sleep faster. So we have 18 hours a day, the average person works around 8 to 10 hours. So let's assume it's 10 hours, so we have 8 hours left. Then you travel around an hour a day, maybe 2 hours a day. So now you have still 6 hours left. So what do you do with the 6 hours? What do you do with the 6 hours? Then we eat a little bit, then we schmooze a little bit, talk a little bit to people and all that stuff. But you can see how much time there is available if you organize your day. So you got to work hard. I mean, let me tell you something. When I went to America, I went to college. I went and worked out five hours a day. And I was working on construction. Because in those days in bodybuilding, there was no money. We didn't, I didn't have the money for food supplements or anything. So I had to go to work. So I worked in construction. I went to college, I worked out in the gym and at night from eight o'clock at night to 12 midnight, I went to acting class four times a week. So I did all of that. There was not one single minute that I wasted. I became very friendly with Muhammad Ali in the 70s. And Muhammad Ali, 
worked his butt off. And I saw it firsthand. And I remember that there was a sports rider that was there in the gym when he was working out and he was doing sit-ups. And they asked him, how many sit-ups do you do? And he said, I don't start counting until it hurts. Now think about that. He doesn't start counting his sit-ups until he feels pain. That's when he starts counting. That is working hard. And so you can't get around the hard work. It doesn't matter who it is. As a matter of fact, I believe what uh, Ted Turner said. Work like hell and advertise. You get it? Work like hell. Go to bed and early, early to rise. Work like hell and advertise. So you work your ass off and then you let the world know about your work. That's what it is all about. Let people know if you have a company, if you have a movie, if you do a sports. Work your ass off, but then advertise and let everyone know. Uh, I hate Plan B. <laughs> and I tell you why. Because we have so many doubters, as I've said earlier, the, the no-sayers. We have so many of those people that say no and you can't do it, it's impossible. That is okay because we just turn off, as I said earlier, and we listen and we hear the no being a yes, you can't do it, do it, you can do it, and all of that. So that, that is possible to do that amongst all the negative people around you. But when you start doubting yourself, that's very dangerous. Because now what you're basically saying is, is that if my plan doesn't work, I have a fallback plan, I have a plan B. And that means that you start thinking about plan B and every thought that you put into plan B, you're taking away now that thought and that energy from plan A. And And it's very important to understand that we function better if there is no safety net because plan B becomes a safety net. It says that if I fail, then I fall and I get picked up and I have something else there that, was, that will protect me. And that's not good because people perform better when there's no safety net. People perform better in sports and everything else if you don't have a plan B. To me, it is very dangerous to have a plan B because you're cutting yourself off from the chance of really succeeding. And the reason, one of the main reasons why people want to have a plan B is because they are worried about failing. What is if I fail, then I don't have anything else? Well, let me tell you something. Don't be afraid of failing because there's nothing wrong with failing. You have to fail in order to climb that ladder. There's no one that doesn't fail. We all fail. It's okay. What is not okay is that when you fail, you stay down. Whoever stays down is a loser. And winners will fail and get up, fail and get up, fail and get up. You always get up. That is a winner. That is a winner. Hey, we all lose. We all have losses. This is okay. And this is why I say don't be worried about losing because when you're afraid of losing, then you get frozen. You get stiff. You're not relaxed. You got to be in order to perform well in anything if it's in boxing or if it is on your job or with your thinking is only happening when you relax so relax it's okay to fail let's just go all out and give it everything that you got that's what it is all about so don't be afraid to fail this is one of my six rules to success you can only feel complete as a person 
if you think about what can you do for your fellow member around you that maybe needs help. I felt like that everyone has a different motivation. Why you get into that? I, I was an immigrant going to America and I saw how America was the most generous country in the world. I mean, they opened up their arms to me, they helped me, they invited me for Thanksgiving dinner, the people, they brought me, uh, the bodybuilders in the gym brought me blades to my apartment because I had no blades, I had no silverware, I had no bedware, I had no pillows, I had no blanket, I had no TV, I had no radio, I had nothing. They brought it to my apartment. They helped me. And I saw that firsthand, this generosity in America. And I said to myself as an immigrant that is being embraced with open arms that I need to go and make sure that I give something back. <laughs> I'm here to plant a seed today, a seed that will inspire you to move forward in life with enthusiastic hearts and a clear sense of wholeness. The question is, will that seed have a chance to take root or will I be sued by Monsanto? <laughs> and forced to use their seed. Which may not be totally Ayurvedic. <laughs> Excuse me if I seem a little bit low energy tonight, today, whatever this is. I slept with my head to the north last night. Oh, oh man! Oh man! You know how that is, right kids? Yeah. Woke up right in the middle of Pitta, couldn't get back to sleep till Vata rolled around. Crazy. But I didn't freak out, you know. I used that time to eat a large meal. <laughs> Connect with someone special on Tinder. Because life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. How do I know this? I don't, but I'm making sound, and that's the important thing. That's what I'm here to do. Sometimes I think that's the only thing that's important, really, you know? It's just letting each other know we're here. Reminding each other that we're part of a larger self. I used to think Jim Carrey is all that I was. Just a flickering light, a dancing shadow, the great nothing masquerading as something you can name. <laughs> Seeking shelter in caves and foxholes, dug out hastily, an archer searching for his target in the mirror, wounded only by my own arrows begging to be enslaved, pleading for my chains, blinded by longing and tripping over paradise. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you didn't think I could be serious, did you? I don't think you understand who you're dealing with. I have no limits. I cannot be contained because I'm the container. You can't contain the container, man. You can't contain the container. I used to believe that who I was ended at the edge of my skin. That I had been given this little vehicle called a body from which to experience creation. And though I couldn't have asked for a sportier model. <laughs> it was, after all, a loner and would have to be returned. Then I learned that everything outside the vehicle was part of me too. And now I drive a convertible. Yeah, man. Top down, wind of my hair. Woo! I am elated and truly, truly, truly excited to be present and fully connected 
to you at this important moment in your journey. I hope you're ready to open the roof and take it all in. Okay, four more years then. <laughs> They're obviously not ready. This needs more cutting. Now, uh, I want to thank the trustees, the administrators, the faculty of MUM for creating an institution worthy of Maharishi's ideals of education, a place that teaches knowledge and experience, the knowledge and experience necessary to be productive in life, as well as enabling the students through transcendental meditation and ancient Vedic knowledge to slack off twice a day for an hour and a half. <laughs> Don't think you're fooling me. <clears throat> but I guess it has some benefits. It does allow you to separate who you truly are and what's real from the stories that run through your head. You have given them the ability to walk behind the mind's elaborate set decoration and to see that there's a huge difference between a dog that is going to eat you in your mind and an actual dog that is going to eat you. <laughs> That may sound like no big deal, but many never learn that distinction. And they spend a great deal of their lives living in fight or flight response. I'd like to acknowledge all of you wonderful parents. Way to go. What a fantastic job you've done. For your tireless dedication, your love, your support, most of all, for the attention that you paid to your children. I have a saying, Beware the unloved, because they will eventually hurt themselves or me. <laughs> but when I look at this group here, you know, I feel really safe. <laughs> I do. I'm just going to say it. My room is not locked. My room is not locked. No doubt some of you will turn out to be crooks. <laughs> But white collar stuff, you know, Wall Street, that type of thing, you know? <laughs> Crimes committed by people with self-esteem. <laughs> stuff parents can still be proud of in a weird way. And to the graduating class of 2017, minus three, <laughs> you didn't let me finish. Congratulations. Yes, give yourself a round of applause, please. please. You are the vanguard of knowledge and consciousness, a new wave in a vast ocean of possibilities. On the other side of that door, there's a world starving for new ideas, new leadership. I've been out there for 30 years. She's a wildcat. <laughs> oh, she'll rub up against your leg and purr until you pick her up and start petting her. And then out of nowhere, she'll swat you in the face. <laughs> it can be rough out there. But that's OK, because there's soft serve ice cream <laughs> with sprinkles. I guess that's what I'm really trying to say here today. Sometimes it's okay to eat your feelings. <laughs> now fear is going to be a player in your life. But you get to decide how much. You can spend your whole life imagining ghosts, worrying about the pathway to the future, but all there will ever be is what's happening here. And the decisions we make in this moment, which are based in either love or fear. So many of us choose our path out of fear disguised as practicality. What we really want seems impossibly out of reach and ridiculous to expect, so we never dare to ask the universe for it. I'm saying, I'm the proof that you can ask the universe for it. Please. And if it doesn't happen for you right away, it's only because the universe is so busy fulfilling my order.
party size. <laughs> My father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant. And when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job. And our family had to do whatever we could to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. It's not the only thing he taught me though. You know, I watched the effect of my father's love and humor and how it altered the world around me. And I thought, that's something to do. That's something worth my time. It wasn't long before I started acting up. You know, people would come over to the house and they'd be greeted by a seven-year-old throwing himself down a large flight of stairs. <laughs> they would say, what happened? And I would say, I don't know, let's check the replay. I'd go back to the top of the stairs and come back down in slow motion. It was a very strange household. My father used to brag that I wasn't a ham, I was the whole pig. And he treated my talent as if it was his second chance. When I was about 28, after a decade as a professional comedian, I realized one night in LA that the purpose of my life had always been to free people from concern, just like my dad. And when I realized this, I dubbed my new devotion the Church of Freedom from Concern. The Church of FFC. And I dedicated myself to that ministry. What's yours? How will you serve the world? What do they need that your talent can provide? That's all you have to figure out. As someone who's done what you're about to go and do, I can tell you from experience, the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. Because everything you gain in life will rot and fall apart, and all that will be left of you is what was in your heart. My choosing to free people, <clears throat> my choosing to free people from concern got me to the top of a mountain. Look where I am. Look what I get to do. Everywhere I go, this, I'm going to get emotional because when I tap into this, it really is extraordinary to me. I did something that made people present their best selves to me wherever I go. I am at the top of the mountain, and I was, and I, the, only, the only one I hadn't freed was myself, and that's when my search for identity deepened. I wondered who I'd be without my fame. Who would I be if I said things that people didn't want to hear? or if I defied their expectations of me? What if I showed up to the party without my Mardi Gras bat mask and refused to flash my breasts for a handful of beads? <laughs> I'll give you a moment to wipe that image out of your mind. <laughs> but you guys are so ahead of the game. You already know who you are. And that piece, that piece that we're after lies somewhere beyond personality, beyond the perception of others, beyond invention and disguise, even beyond effort itself. You can join the game, fight the wars, play with form all you want, but to find real peace, you have to let the armor go. Your need for acceptance can make you invisible in this world. Don't let anything stand in the way of the light that shines through this form. Risk being seen in all of your glory.
that's not big enough. <clears throat> this painting is big for a reason. It's called High Visibility. <laughs> it's about picking up the light and daring to be seen. Here's the tricky part. Everyone is attracted to the light. The party host up at the top who thinks unconsciousness is bliss and is always offering to drink from the bottles that empty you. Misery below her despises the light, can't stand when you're doing well, wishes you nothing but the worst. The queen of diamonds under him needs a king to build her house of cards. And the hollow one down bottom there will cling to your leg and say, please don't leave me behind for I have abandoned myself. Even those who are closest to you and most in love with you, the people you love most in the world will find clarity confronting at times. This painting took me thousands of hours to complete. And when I was finished, thank you, thousands, thousands of hours, yes. I'll never get them back. I'll never get them back. I, was, I worked on this for so long. I was weeks and weeks like a madman alone on the scaffolding. And when I was finished, one of my friends said, this would be a cool blacklight painting. <laughs> so I started over. Welcome to Burning Man. <laughs> Some pretty crazy characters up there, but better up there than in here. <clears throat> you know, painting is one of the ways, thank you. Painting is one of the ways I free myself from concern, a way to stop the world through total mental, spiritual, and physical involvement. But even with that comes a feeling of divine dissatisfaction, because ultimately, we are not the avatars we create. We are not the pictures on the film stock. We are the light that shines through. All else is just smoke and mirrors, distracting, but not truly compelling. I've often said that I wished people could realize all their dreams and wealth and fame and so that they could see that it's not where you're gonna find your sense of completion. Like many of you, I was concerned about going out into the world and doing something bigger than myself until someone smarter than myself made me realize that there is nothing bigger than myself. My soul is not contained within the limits of my body. My body is contained within the limitlessness of my soul. One unified field. One unified field of nothing, dancing for no particular reason, except maybe to comfort and entertain itself. As that shift happens in you, you won't be feeling the world, you'll be felt by it, you'll be embraced by it. Now I'm always at the beginning. I have a reset button, and I ride that button constantly. Once that button is functioning in your life, there's no story that the mind could create that will be as compelling. The imagination is always manufacturing scenarios, both good and bad, and the ego tries to keep you trapped in the multiplex of the mind. Our eyes are not viewers, they are also projectors that are running a second story over the picture that we see in front of us all the time. Fear is writing that script, and the working title is, I'll Never Be Enough. Are you going to look at a person like me and say, how could we ever hope to reach those kind of heights, Jeff? How can we make a painting that's too big for our home? How do you fly so high without a special breathing apparatus? This is the voice 
of the ego. <laughs> and if you listen to it, there will always be someone who's doing better than you. No matter what you gain, ego will not let you rest. It will tell you that you cannot stop until you've left an indelible mark on the earth, until you've achieved immortality. How tricky is this ego that it would tempt us with the promise of something we already possess? So, I just want you to relax. You know, that's my job. <laughs> relax and dream up a good life. I had a substitute teacher from Ireland in the second grade who told my class during morning prayer that when she wants something, anything at all, she prays for it and promises something in return and, and she always gets what she wants. I'm sitting in the back of the classroom, you know, thinking, wow, my family can't afford a bike, you know. So I went home and I prayed for one. And I promised I would recite the rosary every night in exchange. Broke it. Broke that promise. <laughs> but two weeks later, I got home from school to find a brand new Mustang bike with a banana seat and easy rider handlebars. Yeah. From fool to cool. My family informed me that I had won the bike in a raffle that a friend of mine had entered my name in without, any, without my knowledge whatsoever. So that type of thing has been happening to me ever since. As far as I can tell, it's just about letting the universe know what you want and working toward it while letting go of how it comes to pass. Your job is not to figure out how it's going to happen for you, but to open the door in your head. And when the door opens in real life, just walk through it. And don't worry if you miss your cue, because there's always doors opening. They keep opening. And when I say life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you, I really don't know if that's true. <laughs> I'm just making a conscious choice to perceive challenges as something beneficial so that I can deal with them in the most productive way. You'll come up with your own style. That's part of the fun. Oh, and uh, why not take a chance on faith as well? Take a chance on faith, not religion, but faith, not hope, but faith. I don't believe in hope. Hope is a beggar. Hope walks through the fire and faith leaps over it. You are ready and able to do beautiful things in this world. And after you walk through those doors today, you will only ever have two choices, love or fear. Choose love, and don't ever let fear turn you against your playful heart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, President Powers, Provost Fenves, deans, members of the faculty, family and friends, and most importantly, the class of 2014. It is, it is indeed an honor for me to be here tonight. It's been almost 37 years to the day that I graduated from UT. I remember a lot of things about that day. I remember I had a throbbing headache from a party the night before. I remember I had a serious girlfriend who I later married. That's important to remember, by the way. And I remember I was getting commissioned in the Navy that day. But of all the things I remember, I don't have a clue who the commencement speaker was, and I certainly don't remember anything they said. So acknowledging that fact, if I can't make this commencement speech memorable, I will at least try to make it short. So the university's slogan is, what starts here changes the world. Well, I've got to admit, I kind of like it. What starts 
Here Changes the World. Tonight, there are almost 8,000 students, or there are more than 8,000 students, graduated from UT. So that great paragon of analytical rigor, Ask.com, says that the average American will meet 10,000 people in their lifetime. 10,000 people, that's a lot of folks. But if every one of you changed the lives of just 10 people, and each one of those people changed the lives of another 10 people, and another 10, then in five generations, 125 years, the class of 2014 will have changed the lives of 800 million people. 800 million people. Think about it. Over twice the population of the United States. Go one more generation and you can change the entire population of the world. 8 billion people. If you think it's hard to change the lives of 10 people, change their lives forever, you're wrong. I saw it happen every day in Iraq and Afghanistan. A young army officer makes a decision to go left instead of right down a road in Baghdad and the 10 soldiers with him are saved from a close-in ambush. In Kandahar province, Afghanistan, a non-commissioned officer from the female engagement team senses that something isn't right and directs the infantry platoon away from a 500-pound IED, saving the lives of a dozen soldiers. But if you think about it, not only were those soldiers saved by the decisions of one person, but their children were saved, and their children's children. Generations were saved by one decision, one person. But changing the world can happen anywhere, and anyone can do it. So what starts here can indeed change the world. But the question is, what will the world look like after you change it? Well, I'm confident that it will look much, much better. But if you'll humor this old sailor for just a moment, I have a few suggestions that may help you on your way to a better world. And while these lessons were learned during my time in the military, I can assure you that it matters not whether you ever served a day in uniform. It matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation, or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar, and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. I've been a Navy SEAL for 36 years, but it all began when I left UT for basic SEAL training in Coronado, California. Basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, and always being cold, wet, and miserable. It is six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and, and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. But the training also seeks to find those students who can lead in an environment of constant stress, chaos, failure, and hardships. To me, basic SEAL training was a lifetime of challenges crammed into six months. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning, we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened SEALs. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. That you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed.
During SEAL training, the students during training, the students are all broken down into boat crews. Each crew is seven students, three on each side of a small rubber boat, and one coxswain to help guide the dinghy. Every day, your boat crew forms up on the beach and is instructed to get through the surf zone and paddle several miles down the coast. In the winter, the surf off San Diego can get to be eight to 10 feet high, and it is exceedingly difficult to paddle through the plunging surf unless everyone digs in. Every paddle must be synchronized to the stroke count of the coxswain. Everyone must exert equal effort or the boat will turn against the wave and be unceremoniously dumped back on the beach. For the boat to make it to its destination, everyone must paddle. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends, colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. If you want to change the world, find someone to help you paddle. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh, swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. Several times a week, the instructors would line up the class and do a uniform inspection. It was exceptionally thorough. Your hat had to be perfectly starched, your uniform immaculately pressed, your belt buckle shiny and void of any smudges. But it seemed that no matter how much effort you put into starching your hat or pressing your uniform or polishing your belt buckle, it just wasn't good enough. The instructors would find something wrong. For failing the uniform inspection, the student had to run, fully clothed, into the surf zone, then wet from head to toe, roll around on the beach until every part of your body was covered with sand. The effect was known as sugar cookie. You stayed in the uniform the rest of the day, cold, wet, and sandy. There were many a student who just couldn't accept the fact that all their efforts were in vain, that no matter how hard they tried to get the uniform right, it went unappreciated. Those students didn't make it through training. Those students didn't understand the purpose of the drill. You were never gonna succeed. You were never gonna have a perfect uniform. The instructors weren't going to allow it. Sometimes, no matter how well you prepare, or how well you perform, you still end up as a sugar cookie. It's just the way life is sometimes. If you want to change the world, get over being a sugar cookie and keep moving forward. Every day during training, you were challenged with multiple physical events, long runs, long swims, obstacle courses, hours of calisthenics, something designed to test your mettle. Every event had standards, times you had to meet. If you failed to meet those times, those standards, your name was posted on a list, and at the end of the day, those on the list were invited to a circus. A circus was two hours of additional calisthenics designed to wear you down, to break your spirit, to force you to quit. No one wanted a circus. A circus meant that for that day, you didn't measure up. A circus meant more fatigue, and more fatigue meant that the following day would be more difficult and more circuses were likely. But at some time during SEAL training, Everyone, everyone made the circus list. But an interesting, an interesting thing happened to those who were constantly on the list. Over time, those students who did two hours of extra calisthenics got stronger and stronger. The pain of the circuses built inner strength and physical resiliency. Life is filled with circuses. 
you will fail. You will likely fail often. It will be painful. It will be discouraging. At times, it will test you to your very core. But if you, don't, if you want to change the world, don't be afraid of the circuses. At least twice a week, the trainees were required to run the obstacle course. The obstacle course contained 25 obstacles, including a 10-foot wall, a 30-foot cargo net, a barbed wire crawl, to name a few. But the most challenging obstacle was the slide for life. It had a three-level, 30-foot tower at one end and a one-level tower at the other. In between was a 200-foot long rope. You had to climb the three-tiered tower, and once at the top, you grabbed the rope, swung underneath the rope, and pulled yourself hand over hand until you got to the other end. The record for the obstacle course had stood for years when my class began in 1977. The record seemed unbeatable until one day a student decided to go down the slide for life head first. Instead of swinging his body underneath the rope and inching his way down, he bravely mounted the top of the rope and thrust himself forward. It was a dangerous move, seemingly foolish and fraught with risk. Failure could mean injury and being dropped from the course. Without hesitation, the student slid down the rope perilously fast. Instead of several minutes, it only took him half that time. And by the end of the course, he had broken the record. If you want to change the world, sometimes you have to slide down the obstacles head first. During the land warfare phase of training, the students are flown out to San Clemente Island, which lies off the coast of San Diego. The waters off San Clemente are a breeding ground for the great white sharks. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark, at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, Stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if the shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout, and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. As Navy SEALs, one of our jobs is to conduct underwater attacks against enemy shipping. We practice this technique ex extensively during training. The ship attack mission is where a pair of SEAL divers is dropped off outside an enemy harbor and then swims well over two miles underwater, using nothing but a depth gauge and a compass to get to the target. During the entire swim, even well below the surface, there is some light that comes through. It is comforting to know that there is open water above you. But as you approach the ship, which is tied to a pier, the light begins to fade. The steel structure of the ship blocks the moonlight. It blocks the surrounding street lamps. It blocks all ambient light. To be successful in your mission, you have to swim under the ship and find the keel, the center line, and the deepest part of the ship. This is your objective. But the keel is also the darkest part of the ship where you cannot see your hand in front of your face, where the noise from the ship's machinery is deafening, and where it gets to be easily disoriented, and you can fail. Every SEAL knows that under the keel, at that darkest moment of the mission, is a time when you need to be calm, when you must be calm, when you must be composed, when all your tactical skills, your physical power, and your inner strength must be brought to bear. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moments. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the run water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle down to the mud flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive this freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, 
my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up. Eight more hours of bone chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two, and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted, and somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope, the power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start singing when you're up your neck in mud. Finally, in SEAL training, there's a bell, a brass bell that hangs in the center of the compound for all the students to see. All you have to do to quit, all you have to do to quit is ring the bell. Ring the bell and you no longer have to wake up at five o'clock. Ring the bell and you no longer have to be in the freezing cold swims. Ring the bell and you no longer have to do the runs, the obstacle course, the PT, and you no longer have to endure the hardships of training. All you have to do is ring the bell to get out. If you want to change the world, don't ever, ever ring the bell. To the class of 2014, you are moments away from graduating, moments away from beginning your journey through life, moments away from starting to change the world for the better. It will not be easy, but you are the class of 2014, the class that can affect the lives of 800 million people in the next century. Start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never, ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. Thank you very much. Hook'em horns.